one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We're going to start right on time. We got 60 minutes with our guest today, and I cannot thank you enough, Kevin Mills from Myrtle Beach. Thank you so much for being on the call. Uh, we really, really are grateful that you're here with us today. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity, man. I know that I'm going to share a lot of good value today, and, and hopefully a lot of people can get some benefit out of this, because I'm sure they will. Awesome. All right, so we only have a limited time. So there's a bunch of you guys on this call. I'm going to get you guys as much value from Kevin as we possibly can. So we're going to get started right away. So Kevin, take a minute and let us know. Uh, we talked about you being in Myrtle Beach. How long have you been in the business and how many deals will you do this year in 2020? Yeah, so this will be my sixth year in the business and I'll do somewhere around 250 transactions. Amazing. Just to break that down a little bit more on the listing side will probably be 245 of them. So I have some sellers on this side that buy a couple properties a year and, and, uh, and that will be the other ones that, are, that uh, I have on that end. So 250 transactions and what type of income or commissions does that represent for you, Kevin? Yeah, I think last year it was like 1.3. This year it should be somewhere around that neighborhood, somewhere in that, that GCI of, of somewhere close to about 1.3, 1.4 million. Awesome. And certainly, uh, well, tell everybody how old you are. Yeah, I'm 29. You're 29. You're earning $1.3, $1.4 million a year. You're doing 250 deals a year. Certainly, you have 10, 20, 30 agents doing that type of production. Am I right? Yeah, always, always the next question to get to it. No, I'm the only agent on my team. So there's no other agents. Um, any other buyer deals that come in, I refer out to another agent in the office or, or some other people that are within our firm. I don't, do, I don't handle any on the buyer side. But, um, but no, it's just me and I have one assistant and uh, I have a VA that does some data input two, three days a week, but really the core is just me and one assistant who, uh, who is licensed. Awesome. All right. So, so now you guys know the framework, what we're talking about. I hope you've got your pen handy. I hope you're going to focus and be distraction free because I'll tell you part of Kevin's success is his ability to stay focused and disciplined and we're gonna break it all down for you guys right now. So, can you walk us through, Kevin, just the six year trajectory of how many deals you did your first year and that, that progression? Yeah, so the first year I think I did 43 deals. Um, the second year I did 87, and then that second to third was the big jump. It was 87 to 183. And then from 183 I did 243, and then last year I did 268. And this year I'm going to be right there in that range. I mean, it just depends on how October, November goes. But I mean, it could be anywhere from 240 to 270. Slacker. Yeah, I know, right? All right, so good, good stuff. Now, where can you break down kind of where your business comes from? What are the sources yeah. of the business? Yeah, so they, I would say that, that probably 40% of them over time have been and expired. Whether that wasn't expired from this year or last year or two years ago or three years ago, probably 40, I would even say 50% of those are going to be expired. Probably 10% were for sell by owner. So I know that this is a group that, that hammers that pretty hard. Probably 10% were those for sell by owner. Um, another 10% of those are a repeat referral business. And then the rest would be database. So that's people I've spoken with in the past that are just in my database and that I'm just dripping on on a monthly basis. And, uh, and now it just is the time for them to sell. So initially they were a cold call. Got it. All right. Very good. So are you telling me, Kevin, that you don't have a huge $20,000 marketing budget on Zillow? You don't have billboards all over Myrtle Beach. You're not on the radio. You're not doing any of that stuff. I mean, this is all from just the telephone and just talking with people. Yeah. So, so, so I don't. Um, on this side, I run a pretty lean team on my end. So, I mean, my only big expense is my assistant. And that's it. I mean, you take her out of the mix. I'd say my, my operating expenses on a monthly basis are well under $1,000. $1,000 a month outside of your assistant to yep. generate a 1.3, 1.4 million GCI business. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. All right. So, so what are your lead providers? So you're calling expireds, FISBOs, you're calling through some neighborhoods, you're doing some circle prospecting. What are the, the providers of information that you find are best? Yeah, so I was using Kohl's for the Realty Resources, Kohl's for just the neighborhood data. We use those for all the neighborhood searches, C-O-L-E-S. Um, for the expires, man, I pull them all myself. So, I mean, I'll give you the tips to the, the, and, and tricks on it. So, I mean, for me, I pull the expires, I pull the withdrawns, I pull the withdrawns as soon as they get taken off the market, I pull the expires the morning they come off the market. 
I go on to yellow pages, I grab them from there. I go on to white pages, I grab them from there. I use Spokio, we grab it from there. I use Ben Verified, which is a slamming website. I use it from there. I take all that data, I write it all down, I have all the numbers and then I call it. So I'm not using Red X, I'm not using Vulcan. I'm not saying they're bad services, but every other agent in this marketplace is going to be using those services. So I'm trying to hopefully get a couple of those that been, or that, uh, that Red X and the Vulcan 7 aren't able to pull. So that's, those are the sellers that I'm easily able to convert. Wow. All right. So you're coming in every day and you, it's like, you know, you're just a basic business plan. You come in, you pull all the numbers and yep. you go manually go find these information online. Yep. Love it. All right, so here's a question that, that I get that I've got a bunch of different questions for you today, Kevin. Yeah. One of the questions is, okay, this guy's making a million dollars a year. When you first started six years ago, mm -hmm. how long was it from when you started before you got your first listing? And that's a really important time frame for the people on this call today. Yeah, so I got my first listing and it was a for sale by owner the second day I was, I was working. I was just calling through Craigslist and I met this guy and, and I didn't know too much about the business. I never even filled out a contract before and that was my first listing. But I think that the, the crazier part to it or the harder part of my journey is I didn't have my first sell for probably six and a half months until I got into the business. So if I started in December going into January, my first sell wasn't until mid-June. So that's what I want to talk about for a second, Kevin. I want to break that down because I think what a lot of people have trouble with that we're hoping you can help us with today is they're prospecting. They say, Kevin, I'm prospecting, but I'm not, I have nothing to show for it. So this shit does not work. And I'm going to go uh, try something different. Can you help us understand the, uh, the results in detaching from the outcome that manifests later in time from the work that we do today so we can really understand that? Yeah, I mean, what you said was, was completely true. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to know, you can back into your business. So, thankfully, you have obviously a good coaching system here around you, these agents do with you trying to help them and you coaching them throughout this process. So, then it's just figuring out the numbers. So, let's just say you have a goal in mind of doing 40 transactions. So, you go to your mentor, your coach, or maybe you ask some agents, say, I wonder how many people I have to talk to to do 40 transactions. So, you figure out that number. Maybe you get one listing for every 70 people you talk to. So if I get one listing for every 70 people I gotta talk to, then I have to make 2,800 contacts if I'm gonna do 40 transactions. Okay, well how many of those listings are gonna fail to sell? How many of those listings have to do adjustments on it? How many of those listings do I need to take to hit my goals? You have to back into the numbers. The biggest, I think the biggest problem in real estate right now and, and most businesses is most people say they want something but they don't do the math behind it to, to truly commit themselves. So they're not holding themselves accountable. So if I ask on this call, who, wanted to, who wants to be a billionaire? A lot of people are going to say, I want to be a billionaire. Okay, well, what if I told you that you're going to have people offering up to $100 million and $200 million and $400 million for your business at some point? Oh, yeah, I would take $400 million from it. Okay, well, then you don't want to be a billionaire because the billionaires didn't accept $400 million. They grew that shit to a billion-dollar business. You don't want it. You have to be able to do the math, and that's what I did from the start. I got really clear in knowing that I'm going to have to commit my life seven days a week, 12 hours a day to making an insane amount of contacts and building my skills. I'm going to have to role play every single day, all these different situations. I'm going to have to learn all the different objection handlers because once I learn that, I'll be able to have really good conversations over and over and over again. And now I'm at the point where the conversations flow a little bit easier than they have for the past few years. So now instead of maybe 70 people I have to talk to to take a listing, maybe now it's 30. So I've cut that in half because I've grown my skills. So it is a really good process. It's just not the simplest. You have agents in your market that will outspend you and you'll see these huge results. There's agents in my markets doing 300, 400 deals a year, but they're spending $20,000 a month on radio and 15,000 a month on billboard. So you start adding up their expenses and they are gonna do large transactions, but they're gonna outspend you. And then there's ones like me where I'm just gonna outwork you. Seven days a week, there's nobody who's going to outwork me. And that's what I just dedicated uh, that, that portion to is being focused and being determined. Now, and, and that's phenomenal, Kevin. And, and the thing is, a lot of people on this call will hear the words that you're saying, and it will literally go in one ear right out of the other because it's so simple. And we dismiss the simple solution for not being effective. Can you walk us through, I mean, how many contacts or conversations are you having on a daily basis when you first started and now what does your day look like today? Yeah, my minimum when I started was 80 to 85. And that was people I had a conversation with. That's not dials. 
So it was 80 to 85, but I would say over 70% of the time it was 100 plus days. I had a few 150 plus days where I was just booming through contacts. And I was, again, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. I just wanted it. You know, I did the math. I knew what I had to do, and I really committed myself, and I really wanted it. But it took time. I mean, again, I probably listed two properties the second month I was in the business, probably zero three, maybe one four, two five, three six, and it just kept going. In seven months, I was at seven, four listings, then five, then seven, then 10, then 15, then 20, then 30. I mean, it just keeps growing because you're having more conversations, you're getting more practice, you're getting more scripted, and your systems on the back end get better as well. So you can handle more business. More business you do, that it creates a problem of, oh, oh shoot, how do I manage all this business? And then you have to figure out how to manage all the business. And how do I do price reductions? You, you just start having to figure out the systems once you start generating the business. But at this point, people overcomplicate it, and, and now it's just having phone calls and having conversations. So that's really boring, Kevin. That's a boring life. Uh, it's mundane. It's uh, how do in the world do you are you able to sit your rear end in the seat mm-hmm. four, eight, ten, twelve hours a day, seven days a week, and manage the boredom? Yeah, I think it's because I have a good reason of why I'm doing this and I have a good, what do I want? So a lot of people right now, if I was to ask them, hey, what do you want? What do you want in your business? They would have no clue. 95% of the people on this call have no clue because then they say, well, I want to do 100 transactions. It's like, okay, well, what if they were at $20,000 each? Would you want to do 100? No, I wouldn't want to do it if they're that. Okay, so what do you really want? And you could just keep asking questions and what you figure out, most people don't know what they want. So I I had a very clear why I'm doing this and what I wanted. And when I had both of those things on this side, it was really easy for me to master repetitious boredom. That's all I'm doing, man. I always say I'm the Tim Duncan of, uh, of the real estate world. Tim Duncan was a hell of a basketball player, man, but all he did was catch the ball and turn around and make layups over and over and over and over again. I'm just Tim Duncan. There's nothing too fancy about me, but I don't look at the shiny objects. And I can tell you that the top producers in this industry, and I've met 90% of them by now, I believe that are individual agents, they all do the same thing. They all are bored out of their minds, they're on the phone, but they're engaging. When I say bored, I mean, what we do is, is boring, but they're engaging on the phone. They're not, they're not slacking through the phone calls. They're active, they're aggressive, they have smiles on their face. They're asking engaging questions and they're closing. They're not hating their jobs. And that's one of the reasons, especially for sell by owners, so many agents don't succeed because you're not looking forward to going on that for sell by owner preview. And you're not looking forward to doing the follow up at the end. But that's what you got to do if you're going to work for sell by owners. It's a marathon. And very rarely you're going to have something where it's print, where immediately you call them, they're going to say, dude, I just didn't know any real estate agents. So, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm open to meeting with you. And you sign them that day. The majority of it is going to be a longer haul. And if you aren't excited about that, you're not going to be able to present well. And if you don't present well, you're not going to list them. And we're going to talk about all of that in just a second. We're going to get more tactical with them yeah. in a minute, Kevin. One more big mindset question, and then we'll kind of get into some tactics. Yeah. Um, so what you just said, you just outlined a very simple process to help an agent go from, you were brand new to real estate six years ago. I think you were selling cars before. Yep. I don't know what you were making before, call it 60,000, to go to 1.3 million through phone calls. You have people, Kevin, on this call that are struggling badly financially. Yeah. And why can't an agent, knowing what you just said, it's so simple. They can just have conversations, their skills will get better. We talk a lot about the pain of staying the same, right, is not as great as the pain of change. And so, right. They won't change their behavior. They could be dead broke, $100,000 in credit card, and as soon as they start making phone calls, they stop after the fifth contact. Why are you able to push through that pain when so many agents just can't, in your opinion? Yeah, I think at the beginning, I tied it to knowing that after I talk to 70 people, I'm going to get one listing, and that one listing is going to pay my mortgage, or it's going to pay my groceries that month, or it's going to pay whatever it is. So every no was just one step closer to a yes. So I have my sheet in front of me, and I'm counting my contacts. And the second one hangs up on me, and the third one hangs up on me, the fourth one's like a maybe, but I'm a year and a half out. I know I'm getting closer to that magic 70 number that I need to hit to get my listing, so I'm able to provide for my family. And honestly, I wanted to be that rock and that support system for my family, for myself, for my parents, for my friends. I wanted to be the ones they looked at and said, damn, he did it. 
this kid did it. He came in there and he kicked ass. And all you have to do is sit here and make phone calls and be engaged in the conversation and ask good questions and, and just really hone in your skills and always keep learning. It's just most people get very distracted. Their phone will ring or they'll get a Facebook message or they'll get an email they get tied to. Or maybe somebody wants to grab coffee or an extended lunch or an early happy hour or a realtor event or an open house. There's so many distractions, but my family knows, my wife knows, don't call me between eight and five. Don't. Don't text me between eight and five unless it's an emergency. I'm working. And especially between eight and 11 o'clock in the morning where I do the hard prospecting, not one of my friends, not one of my family would ever reach out to me in that time period because they know I'm dedicated. And, I'm, and you have to show that because we all have probably past experiences where your family's like, oh, here he goes again with another experience. Oh, now he says he's going to do this. Or now you have to actually show up and you have to show them, no, I'm committed. I'm going to do this every day. Every day I'm going to call and I'm going to set this amount of appointments. I'm going to take this amount of listings. I'm going to grow my business. I'm going to make this amount of money and then I'll be able to have blank. And you got to know what that blank is because that's the thing that's going to keep you going, man. When everything looks bad and four people tell you to F off in a row, it's that vision of here's where I'm going to be when this is over. It's phenomenal. And people, you're known in the industry for the king of consistency. When yeah. you're asked the question, Kevin, what is the number one piece of advice would you attribute your six-year run to becoming a millionaire I've heard you say time and time again, it's consistency. Is that still the answer to today? 100%. Yeah, I think it's consistency and, and I'm always learning. So on this side, I never feel like I learn at all. I still practice my scripts. I still write down different objection handlers. I mean, I got to the point where if I didn't know an objection handler and somebody stumped me on the phone or I didn't like the way I handled it, I'd take the next 30 minutes or however long it took me and I'd write down eight different ways I could have handled that objection. And then I memorize all different eight ways. And then, just the, and now I've gotten to the point just to get tactical for a half a second where if there are certain personality type, I know which objection handler works best on. Like it, you, you get to dive into your craft so much that, I mean, it's, it's really NLP um, where, where you're just, you're playing a game, man. And that's the way I feel like I'm doing is I'm playing a game. And, uh, and I attribute a lot of it too is when I get home at night, for those who have a family, when I get home at night and I turn off my car and I'm about to open my door, game's over for the day. Game's over. I'm not going to let my family experience a roller coaster of, damn, I just lost another transaction today. Or boom, I got another one under contract. Or, oh, crap, I had a fall through today. They're not going to have that roller coaster. Every day, dad and husband and father, whatever it might be, I'm going to show up at home the exact same way. So they just know me as happy. I'm home. Everything's good. Dude, that's phenomenal. All right. So how many, how many active listings? Everyone, you guys want to fall out of your seat? How many active listings are you managing right now? I'm low right now. So, I mean, I have 97. I'm usually between 115, 125. Stuff keeps selling, man. In our market right now, this is the first time, at least in my real estate career, where I can say we actually have a hot market. Myrtle Beach never has. We have a lot of active inventory, but it's never really hot. Properties are selling fast right now. So, stuff's just turning a lot faster. So, you got 97 listings that you're working on right now. That's more than most agents will sell in five years. How many under contract and how many closed for September? I'd say 47 under contract. There, there's some closing every day. So somewhere around 47, 48 under contract right now. And how many closed for September? I'd have to load that, but I think we're, we're probably right about 17 to 19 right now. And at the end of this month, we probably have a solid 15 closing between September 29th and 30th. It's phenomenal. All right. Walk us through your daily schedule. If you could get granular on it, like when you yeah. do offers, when you do this, that, and the other thing, that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, first thing in the morning, I wake up, I go to the gym, at, I wake up at 3.55. So I'm on 3.55. So you guys, 3.55 happens twice in a day. Yeah. 3.55 a.m. you wake up. Got it. Yeah. And it sucks. Every morning it sucks. But what I figured out about waking up early, if you get, it, it takes literally three seconds for your brain to start working in the morning and it to tell you, dude, go back to sleep. Dude, it's too early, it's too cold, it's too rainy, you worked out hard yesterday, you're a little bit sore, you gotta get out of bed before that three seconds kicks in immediately. Because once you're already up, your brain ain't gonna be telling you that stupid story in your brain. You just gotta keep going. I'm at the gym at 4.15 with a group of two other guys that are also real estate agents. Um, we're done by that by 5.30. I'm at the office by 6.00. Um, I'm pulling numbers, expired withdrawals, answering emails, just kind of catching up and preparing for my day, appointments, 
things like that until about 750, 750. I'm at my prospecting station setting up my calls and in the order which I want to do them. Role playing a few scenarios in my head just to make sure my brain's on the right wavelength. Eight o'clock till 11 o'clock, I'm on the phone every day. That, that hasn't changed since I started. 11 o'clock, if I don't have appointments, I'll probably take a quick lunch. Um, after lunch, I'm either going on appointments or I am, uh, or I'm making prospecting calls. That's it. If there's some fires that I need to put out, I would do it in that time frame. And then in the afternoon, the same thing. If I'm not on appointments, I'm on the phone. And now I'm on the phone typically till five to six, somewhere in there. Um, I, I'm, I'm typically not working after six. If I am, it's because I have appointments or I had appointments all day. So now I got to catch up on my afternoon stuff at night. But, uh, but when I first started, man, it was eight to eight. And it was eight to eight for three years. Wow. So, so that's, that's amazing. So how do you handle or manage the busyness of the business as it relates to offers and, Hey, Kevin, what about this, that, and the other thing? I mean, obviously you've got an assistant now, I but do. is there a system for how you handle offers and things of that nature? When I, now that I have an assistant or before I had an assistant? Probably before, because most of the people okay. right now don't have a full-time assistant. Yeah, so if I had offers before, so my game plan was this. From 8 to 11, my cell phone was nowhere even close to me. My cell phone was across the room. My laptop was shut. I was making calls, and that's all that I heard. If somebody made an offer, they were checking in on something, their clients, didn't matter. Between 8 and 11, that's my sacred schedule of when I prospect. So then between that 11 and 1, I would do all that. I would do all my phone calls. I'd do all my, uh, I'd do all my uh, offers. Anything that needed to be done from a servicing standpoint was done between 11 and 1, 11 and 2. And then 3 o'clock, kids get out of school. People that work the morning shift are getting off around 3 o'clock. 3 to 5 o'clock, 3 to 6 o'clock, I was back on the phones. Again, at 5 or 6, I'd be taking a look and making sure there was nothing I had to service. Once I service it, I'm back on the phones. So I was either I was all in or all out. You know, I wasn't half and half. I wasn't answering emails and making phone calls and sending texts and talking to him. I was I was doing one thing at a time. So I had 100% focus on making phone calls, 100% focus on handling offers, 100% on doing reductions. I just kept my my focus so singular because once you start juggling, something's getting dropped. You're either not as active on the phone or you mistype something on an email or you forget something. You got to be singularly focused. Got it. Yeah, because I got a lot of agents right now that are commenting like, oh, that makes me real nervous, you know, to, to not be attached to my phone for four hours as I'm prospecting. But you just, you just answered the question. Yeah. It's like, you guys, you guys are missing it. Focus yeah. is the opposite of distraction. So if you're focused, that means you're saying no to everything else. All of us are distracted. You've got your phone, you're making a prospecting phone call and trying to text and email and oh here, oh, here comes Brandon. Oh, I got to do this Facebook thing. And that's why you guys constantly tell me, how in the world can you do 50 contacts in a day? Kevin, are you still doing 50 contacts a day and have 100 listings? Yeah. I mean, I would say that I'm doing somewhere on a daily basis between 35 and 60. Um, some days it's 30, 35. Some days it's 60, 65. Depends on my appointments and it depends on kind of my follow-up schedule. Now, how many appointments or what does what your, your, your perfect week look like? How many appointments do you typically go on during a five day week? Yeah, so for me, the perfect ones are when I don't have to go on any appointments. I can do them all over the phone. Yeah. And I do a lot of my business over the phone. And that's the easiest way to do it. And a lot of people who live in town and they own a house, I can still do it over the phone. Because people are busy and people are, with this COVID, they're being a little bit more cautious. So I can look at pictures or I have them send me a video. So I try to stay as much as I can in the office. So a perfect week for me is taking probably eight to 10 listings. So like I want to take eight to 10 listings. So I mean, if I have to go on four or five go-tos, then that's great. If I don't have to go on any go-tos and I can knock them all out via the phone or a Zoom call or something like that, that's way better for me. Because one thing I heard from a very early stage in real estate is you don't make money looking through a windshield. So wow. if you can prevent your time looking through a windshield, you're going to be able to make more money. And it's so true, man. You're in the car and again, you're trying to juggle things. You're getting texts and you're getting calls and you're trying to figure out where you're going and you want to get your mind right for an appointment and, and you could be all scatterbrained by the time you get there. So I try to knock them all out there. So I would say that my, my perfect week looks like 10 listings. 10 listings a week, 40 a month, right? Yep. Yep. Love it. All right. So, so now you're on the phone. Let's get a little bit tactical, right? So uh, I don't know if you'd be open to a role play, but, but sure. you know, uh, I'll just start off with this. This yeah. The untrained agent makes a call to a for sale by owner to an expired. They get the reflex no, as you know, Kevin, and the phone call is over. That's it. It's yep. over. It's gone. So can we do a little role play on an expired and maybe a for sale by owner? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one do you want to start with? Let's start with expired. Okay. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey, is this Brandon? This is Brandon. Hey, Brandon, it's Kevin Mills with Century 21 here in Myrtle Beach. I was trying to give you a quick call. Do you own a home on XYZ Street? I do. I was reaching out. I'm sure you probably have noticed by now the property came off the market and I saw where it fell to sell over with Mary Smith with XYZ Company. And in the interim, while you were on the market, we've actually represented a lot of the sellers around you and helped them maximize their sales price. Just curious, is that something you would even entertain an offer on anymore? I mean, yeah, we'd be open to it. Okay, you'd be open to, to an offer. Just curious, where, what were you kind of hearing from the agents that were showing the property while it was active? I mean, did you have any offers? What was kind of some of the feedback you were getting? Well, that's kind of the issue. We, we didn't get a lot of information or we didn't get a lot of feedback at all. Okay, didn't get a lot of feedback at all. Just curious, where are you going once you sell the property? I mean, the plan is to get down to Florida. Okay, and how soon would you like to, like to be down there? Well, I mean, that's, that, that's the thing, Kevin. I mean, uh, we don't know yet. We're going to kind of pause and kind of reset to see what's going to happen here moving forward. I got you. But I mean, if you could get down to Florida in the next 45, 60 days, would that be a problem for you? If your house went under contract today, closed in about 40 days and you were down in Florida, would that, would that be an inconvenience or would that actually help you? Yeah, I think we'd be okay with that. Okay. Now what's down in Florida? You know, we got a, we've got we uh, got all of our family down there. That's where we're from. We were up in okay. Middle for, for a job transfer, but we're going back home. Okay. Awesome. Makes sense. Well, one thing I'd like to do, Brandon, is, is I'd love to come over. I'd love to see the property. I'd love to at least walk you through why I think the property didn't sell. I'd love to go up through the condition, really see the home through the eyes of a buyer. And I think I can share with you, no matter how you move forward or whether you move forward in one day or month, one month or one year, at least you're going to be speaking to somebody who understands marketing, who understands exposure. And I really believe that's the reason the property didn't sell. I see a lot of things behind the marketing and exposure of it. I just feel like it should have been done differently. And if you had 10 to 15 minutes a little bit later today. I'd love to come over. I'd love to see the property. Just talk to you for a little bit and then we can kind of just take the conversation from there. Would that work? Perfect. Yeah. And I would just say, hey, is any other decision makers need to be there? Does anybody else need to own the property? Is this the best number for me to have for you? And then I would jump into, okay, this is your best number. This is your cell number. Okay. I'm going to text you my information. Put me in your phone. Save me as a contact. That way you know when it's me calling because there's so many agents that are blasting this guy. Great, what's your wife's name? Great, what's her phone number? I'm gonna text her off my phone so she has my number too. Great, what's your email address? I'm gonna send you some information on me. I'm gonna bombard this guy with information before we meet so he knows I'm active, I'm aggressive, he'd feel bad if he had to cancel the appointment and then he can kind of do the research on me because I'm anticipating this dude's getting 30 more phone calls when I get off the phone. And there might be somebody out there that catches them in a better mood or maybe he doesn't have his hands full of groceries. Like I have to make sure that he's committed to meeting me. Yeah. Now here's the, here's the reality, Kevin. The reason why I love that role play, you know, uh, I give you the most, the utmost respect, but there's nothing earth shattering. You're just doing it over and over. You guys, did Kevin say anything magical? All of you should be saying no. Kevin just does it so much more than all of you that he's super confident. He knows exactly what to say to everything that I would have brought up. That's the difference. Two agents, they call the same list, Kevin. One succeeds, one fails, the same list, same time. Yep. And you'll see a lot of confidence. That confidence, man, is probably one of the other things I would attribute some success to. From the very beginning, I walk into that place like I own it. You know, I walk into the place like I've already gotten the listing, I walk out like I got it sold. You know, it's just a mentality I have when I walk in. And you have to have that because, listen, the amount, of, and did you hear me say anything about selling 100 properties or 200 properties or being the number one agent or being this? Dude, they will never ask you that. When you have the confidence, they will never ask you how many homes you sell. I hardly ever get asked that question. Because yeah. I have the confidence, I'm answering their questions. I'm not stuttering. I'm speaking clearly. And once I realize on the phone conversation, man, when you started a sentence and you were a little bit more laid back, I just laid back in my chair a little bit. Mirror and match. I try to be like you. It's great. Now, we're getting some questions. Uh, how, many yeah. of your, how many of your listings are absentee owners versus owner occupants? I'd say it's usually like 40% absentee, 60% uh, in person. They, they live there. Yeah, yeah. All right. That makes a ton of sense. And so, uh, are you mailing to expires and FISBOs and doing a ton of direct mail or just calls? No, I've never done direct mail. No direct mail. You doing any email marketing? Well, yeah. So we have Infusionsoft. Yes. Greg provides that. So I mean, it's something we have campaigns on this side that get ran on these people once a month. So once a month, they're getting that. I'm calling them once a quarter just to kind of stay in communication with them. We use a few other platforms that lets them know uh, 
kind of what's going active in the neighborhood, what's selling in the neighborhood. That's real geeks. They're on active and sold search with real geeks. It just gives them that. But other than that, man, that's it. All this should sound real familiar. And so, Kevin, let me ask you this. You know, um, when you're, let's talk about your lead follow-up because this is another real, real difficult thing for, for agents to understand. Yep. Of the business that you're doing, the 250 deals, how many are coming from contacts that you made one time versus the database that you've built over six years, would you say? 85% or 90% comes from the database or it comes from people I'm just following up with, man. So, I mean, they could have expired four weeks ago, but now I've had 15 conversations with a guy and he's really, he's now ready to go. We need to build relationships. That's what this is about. You have to connect and build a relationship with these people. You can't go in there just trying to fill your own pockets. Because if you go in there with that, you might get some listings. You might crack a couple and, and get, get, get some good money from that. You're not going to be able to build a sustainable business. And that should be what we all want. We should all want a good business that's duplicatable, that sustains itself, and that's predictable. So we don't have to worry about where's my next deal coming from? How am I going to get a listing today? So, so coach us through that really quick about building the database and monetizing the conversations and the contacts over six years because that's something that your team really focuses on that I wish I can really get across to these folks in this group that I love so much. Yeah, so I mean for us, we, uh, so if I make a contact with somebody and they say, Kevin, I appreciate it, no chance we're selling no matter what. Price was perfect, we have a condition, we can't move for seven months. I'd say, great, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot you over my information. It sounds like it might be a little bit too early for us to meet today. So I'm, gonna shoot, or, so I'm gonna shoot you over my information, my track record marketing, I'm gonna shoot you over the most recent sales, and we're gonna communicate, we're gonna stay in communication throughout this entire period. So that way, if you need anything from me, obviously you have all my contact information, and I'm gonna keep sending you some good information on the community. So I'm gonna take their name, I'm gonna put them in Infusionsoft, I'm gonna put them in Real Geeks, I'm gonna send them an email, a one-off email, thank them for their time, thank them for communication, all of that on that end. I'm gonna put in my notes, if it's a cold call, then I'm gonna call them back in a month from that conversation. Even though they said seven months, I'm gonna call them back in like a month, three weeks to a month. If it's an expired, I'm calling them back the next day. If it's a for sale by owner, I'm calling them back the next day. If it's a hotter kind of target, I'm calling them back immediately after and I already know what I'm gonna say. Maybe I was just checking in, Brandon. I wanna make sure that you got my email that I shot over yesterday. Had a lot of good information. Did you have a chance to take a look at that? Yeah, Kevin, we had a chance to take a look at it. And again, seven, eight months, listen, I, I know you're seven or eight months down the line. And just to confirm again, if I did have a buyer in the next three or four months, that wouldn't even work for you? Or is that something you would entertain a one-time showing? It's just tr really digging in and getting that information. And now, man, I have people that I'll call tomorrow on my, uh, on my call list that, man, I got notes back to 2017, 2016, 2018. So I just have to go through the dialogue of where we ended up at last time and I'd say one thing that I've mastered is how to have that phone call very fast. So a lot of people could say, dang, dude, that's a lot of people you're talking to for, for not even a listing for seven or eight months down the line. That conversation is 30 seconds max, 45 seconds max. All right. So, so two big things. So it's 1.30. We've got about 20, 25 more minutes left. Um, how do you manage your lead follow-up? Because th that's the question I get all the time. So how are you managing these call lists and, and what does that look like? Probably the absolute stupidest way possible. Where a lot of people have these databases that they're doing it, all of my people are in Gmail calendar. Oh, I had that for a while. I had that for a while. I had that for a while. I did that for a long time. Then I started not to be able to read my handwriting. <laughs> I started not to be able to read my handwriting. I didn't know whether it was a seven or a nine or a four or what their name was. Or right. I wasn't able to put notes in that book as well. Hold on, can, I pause you for a second? can I pause you for one second? Yeah. How much money were you making off this folder, this system, before you entered a, 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 a piece of technology? Yeah, I think I did about $700,000 that year. In Dude, you guys, 700,000 on pieces of paper in my little folder system. So anyway, all right, keep going. So you manage yeah, it? Yeah, so it's a Gmail calendar, man, that's it. And if they're real hot, I tag them as red, so they come up as red. And if they're lukewarm or cold or red, they're purple, which is just like the standard color. And that's it, man. I just throw them on a date, I forget about it. And multiple times throughout the day, I check that Gmail calendar. That's what I do with my appointments too. I just throw them in there. I got an appointment at 12 tomorrow, boom. Appointment 12, here's their name, here's the address. Real simple, real basic, <laughs> real boring, no sexiness to it at all. Nope. Love it. All right, now, the big question is uh, around 
you, a man or a, a guy that's doing the amount of business you're doing, you have to be super intentional with your time, as you've mentioned a few times. Before you go and leave your seat, your prospecting station, to go spend an hour there, hour back, what are you going to do? What's your process before you determine, am I going to go preview this FISBO? Am I going to go on this appointment or I'm not going on this appointment? What does that look like for Kevin Mills? Yeah, so my schedule's changed a lot. So I would say that I'm a lot more intentional now than when I first started. Like if I was not desperate, but if I really needed some business, I wanted to really build up my business and I didn't have appointments this afternoon, I would set my entire afternoon, three days a week at least, and jam pack it with every for sale by owner in town that I could get in there to the door of. And then I would go into like MapQuest or something and I would figure out the best route to knock out all four of them. And I would schedule my appointments in that row to be the most effective that I can. And I would go on as many previews as I can. I would get in as many doors as I can, try to start building those relationships out of those. And, and listen, I would, I would disqualify some of them. If it was just somebody who's putting it out there, wanting an unrealistic price, they have no motivation and they're going to be a jerk. Don't go. You don't have to work with those kinds of people. But most of the people that you talk to that are for sale by owner aren't going to be like that. Most of them are, are going to want to save money. They think they can do it by themselves. But what they're going to realize is they don't have the systems and processes and exposure that you have. And, and you just have to ease them into that conversation. You got to ask them questions while you're walking around and previewing the property. And then hopefully by the end of you previewing, you're able to sit them down at a table and just slowly start going through the process of what it would look like if they decided at some point down the road to go with you. I love it. But I'm so, on all of them. So, so half the people are on that system. The other half are asking me, well, now, Brandon, I'm getting a little bit busier. What, how do you determine that today with your, your schedule? How are you determining? I pre-qualify everybody, I talk. Everybody before I leave my desk, I pre-qualify. And I still get, let me just tell you something, take up a little bit of time. I went on an appointment this morning that I called at 10 a.m. and it was an 11 o'clock appointment like 20 minutes down the road, I show up today at 11 o'clock and he told me that he signed paperwork with the guy at 1030. Wow. Didn't even call me. Didn't he? I still get the, the BS, you know, and you're going to get that. But guess what I did? I took it out of my head and I threw it away. And I'll never think about that guy ever again or the situation. I'm completely detached. That sucks, but I'm completely detached. But, but, and that's with a really good prequel. So I wow. pre-qualify every single person I talk to. It's, Hey, Thanks for your time earlier today. Just making sure we're still good today at two o'clock. Does that still work for you? Yes, it does. Right, now, when I come over, is that some? When I come over, are all the decision makers going to be present? Are you the only owner? Is anybody else who owns a property going to be there? Yeah, it's just going to be me. Just me. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, so when I come over, it's just going to be you handling it. One thing I like to do, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier, I really want to walk the home through the eyes of a buyer. So when I get there, I really want to take a look throughout the entire property. Is, is it prepared for showing? Like if you had somebody called you right now and they're ready to see the property, are you guys prepared to, to show the house? Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be that. Yeah, for sure. Side note, the reason I'm asking that is to see when they're looking to really get started putting this in. But they're like, no, man, I mean, we wouldn't be able to show this thing for two weeks. All right, mm -hmm. now you know this guy's two weeks out from doing anything with any buyer, which could be a pro, could be a con once you get some further information. So it's like, great. After we see that, one thing I like to do is sit you down, just share with you some things I'm doing behind the exposure of these properties to help my clients get you the most amount of money. Now, I'm not coming there ask, begging you to sign a contract or, or putting pen to paper immediately, but what I like to do is show you some approaches I'm taking. Maybe they make sense for you. Maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to embrace some of these ideas on yourself, but at the end of the day, I think you're going to get a lot of value after that, and then you can see what I'm doing, what I'm offering to my clients to help get them the most amount of money. And they usually say, yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, Kevin, but we're probably still going to do for sale by owner for a little bit. Yeah, I understand. But, but again, I mean, if I could show you where I could put more money in your pocket, you, you'd probably entertain at least the thought of putting it on the market. You don't care whether I sell it or you sell it as long as you get the same amount of money or more in your pocket, right? I that's mean, it's just right. using those lines, man. And you'll get the answers from them. They'll give you the answers. And then you sit down at the table, man, and you just make it a very easy, easy smooth conversation. And that's just try to build a relationship. Yep. I love it. I love it. It's real non-threatening. It's like, Hey, let's look at this. If it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Yeah. Love it. All right. So very cool. Now, um, you had said something to me off air yesterday because we're in a for sale by owner training program. You've got a for sale by owner system that, uh, you had talked to me about. Do, do we have time to go through that real quick? Yeah, 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 for sure. Let me, let me load it up on my end. Cause I, I have it here and I just haven't I'm going to get gotten it done. I think the first thing is committing yourself to this system. So you got to do your math behind it first. 
So you guys say, all right, am I willing to go on all these previews? Am I willing to be excited for every preview? Am I willing to do a lot of follow-up after I go on these previews? Am I willing to play the long-term game with these people to get this business? And if not, then you should really reconsider doing this. That's because you're doing that, this. Yeah. And, and that, what you just said is exactly what I've been teaching for four yeah. years. So it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing this to get more listings, more commissions, and just have a more controllable business, right? So for me on this side, let me grab it real quick. No um, yeah, the first thing is where do you pull these at? So I think pulling them are important. So Zillow, Craigslist, Facebook, May, or Marketplace, the Penny Saver publications, a lot of those, I mean, are going to be great resources for pulling those for sale by owners. Red X, Land Boys, Vulcan 7, all have a, all have a good amount on that end as well. Um, I, I think the biggest part to calling for sale by owners is the best day of the week to call for sale by owner is Monday. By far, by far. Because on Monday, guess what happened? The weekend came and gone. They didn't get an offer. They didn't have all the showings. And your first phone call is, hey, Brendan, just wanted to check, check in with you. The real estate market this past weekend was on fire. I don't think I've ever had so many showings on my properties. I'm getting offers left and right. Just curious, how many showings did you end up getting this weekend? Boom! Even if they got one or two or three right. or four, it's still not going to be enough. So then what you need to tell them is actually one thing you might not know is in the last seven days, this many properties went under contract in our market. And then, and then you can build up to an appointment and man, if they sense that confidence coming off of you, they start just having more self doubt. Doubting, man, am I doing everything I should be doing? Am I doing anything as far as exposure? Obviously what I'm doing is not working. So, so on that, that end of it, I think that, uh, I think that that's the best time to do it. Now, homework that I would be doing is I think you should watch one YouTube video a day on for sell by owners people prospecting for sell by owners to try to get some ideas. I think you do that either at 5 a.m. or you do it at like 10 p.m. at night. You got to do this homework as a side hustle because you can't do it during generating hours. But you got to be watching YouTube. You got to commit to practicing the scripts with somebody, getting role play partners. You got to commit to a certain amount of contacts for, for sell by owners, a certain amount of appointments, a certain amount of listings on that side. Um, second, you got to commit to taking the tour. And then you got to meet them face to face. You got to establish rapport. You got to put yourself in position to win. Demonstrate you're the right person for the for the job on that side. And uh, and on my end, one thing I try to gauge is the 80-20 principle, where I'm asking questions 80% of the time, and I'm only speaking 20% of the time. Big so, one. All about questions. Ask, now, ask, ask. Now here's now here's a hard thing. So everything you just outlined is is a it's almost identical to what we've been teaching our students here, which is great. Yeah. The, the challenge for our students, Kevin, is, is showing that confidence and asking for the business because the seller's in pain. They have a problem. They've got to get their property sold. How would you coach uh, the agents on this call to get past that fear of just posing you as the solution and asking for that appointment? May I tell you the million dollar question? It's always, you want to get great rapport, get all the questions you have answered. And at the end of you asking questions and when you feel like there's nothing else you can say, you say, have you heard enough information to make a decision to list your property with me today? And if they say no, what other information can I provide you with them? What other thing can I provide? What other information can we go over right now so you can feel comfortable to move forward? And then you're going to hear the objection or they're going to say, well, you really didn't talk about pricing too much or you really didn't tell me how your commission structure worked or you really didn't talk to me about marketing. But most of the time, man, they're just going to say yes. And then all you got to do is break out the paperwork and shut your mouth and get it, so and get it signed and walk out the door. So much of the time, the, the people are ready to sign. You just keep talking. And eventually, you probably talk your way out of it. Yeah. What about when you're on the phone? So you're doing your Monday follow-up calls yep. as I teach. And, you know, these guys are really good at going on preview appointments or getting out there. They're doing 20 preview appointments. This is what I teach. Yep. Of the 20 preview appointments, they should be able to list eight through the Monday follow-up phone call. Yep. Where they have trouble is converting the follow-up phone call into a listing opportunity over the telephone. So as you're following up with Fizbo's on the Monday call, how are you converting that Monday follow-up call into a listing appointment? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm purposely making them doubt what they're doing. So for me, it's, it's saying, oh, great, yeah, the market was this, market was that. Just curious how many sons you have. Just curious to me, how many calls were you even getting over your ad over the weekend? And I mean, besides Zillow or besides Mar whatever you saw them on, where else are you marketing the property? Hmm. Can, can we roleplay that call? Can we roleplay? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Go ahead. Ring, ring. Hello, this is Brandon. Hey, Brandon, it's Kevin Mills again with Century 21. How are you? I'm doing well. 
Good, man. I, I'm sure that, uh, that you're busy as can be over there. I know the real estate market this past week has been on fire in your area. I'm taking a look right now. 34 houses went under contract in the last week. Just curious, I mean, were you able to get your sold over the weekend? No, no, we were not. No. Got some hot prospects that, that are thinking of writing offers or, or kind of what, 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 what's going on with it? Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple people come through, but uh, that's, okay. you know, no, nothing, nothing, no offers at this point. Okay. Yeah. And were you screening those people before they came in? Did you make sure they were qualified and that proof of funds and intent to purchase and can't kind of could afford the property or you just let anybody in the house right now? Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, I guess, yeah, we, we don't have a real system for that, I guess. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Realistically, I mean, the more eyes, the better, right? So, so I didn't know if you were taking that approach. I'm just curious. I mean, besides Zillow, Brandon, well, where else are you marketing this property? Um, you know, we've got the sign and, you know, we're, we're doing open houses at this point. Yeah. Are you getting any traffic through the open houses when you hold them? I know that those aren't really scheduled. No, I mean, we're getting a couple of people here and there. I tell you, on my end through open houses, I have this complete domination plan that I use on my end for my clients to make sure that when we do hold an open house, if that's something that you want us to do, we hold them extremely successfully. So on this side, we, we have open houses that get tons of qualified buyers through the property. We make sure that we're vetting them when they come in as well, take their information so we know that they're qualified people. Just curious, I mean, how many showings have you had in the past week? I mean, probably one. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is in that typical area, I was just looking through the stats. In that typical area this week, you've seen between seven and 11 properties uh, or seven and 11 showings per property in that area. So I was just wondering kind of how you, how you stuck uh, or how, how you compared to that. Just curious. I mean, the house is really nice brand. Now. I'm curious. I mean, what, what feedback did you get from that one person? I mean, not a whole lot. I mean, they came through and, and that was really, I mean, we hadn't heard back yet. Yeah. And I mean, how long have you been trying to get this sold now? Uh, you know, we've only been trying for about, you know, two or three weeks, I think. Yeah. And you have it priced at $250,000, right? I mean, how'd you come up with that price? I mean, we looked at what's selling in the area and, and felt that what, what our house has. And, you know, I guess, you know, do, do you have a buyer for our house? Yeah, I might. I mean, I'm just wondering in the event that you decided to hire an agent like myself and I, and I applied some aggressive marketing strategies to the property. I mean, would it be okay if we, we got the property sold in the first two or three weeks? Well, sure, of course. Okay, okay. Now, I know you're working hard to sell this on your own, but, but I mean, it sounds like you might be open to start considering agents. Am I starting to hear that in your voice that it's something you might even just consider a conversation? I'm not saying that you're definitely listing the property today, but would you consider hiring a real estate agent and uh, right now in the market? I mean, I don't think we're there yet, but, but certainly, yeah, if we can't get this thing sold in the next couple of weeks, we'd be open to something, I think. I got and what would you want in the agent that you chose? I mean, obviously we want someone who can get the property sold. And um, I mean, that, that's really the, the main thing at this point. I got you. So if you met a real estate agent and they, they completely convinced you that they were the agent that could get this property sold, you were confident in their approach. They took all kind of the, the burden of having to show the property and qualify the people and do the photos and the videos and the marketing and the exposure kind of off your plate. Then you would be willing to, to move forward with them if they hit that one box. Yeah, I think we'd be open to that. Okay. Well, I'd say this, Brandon, and again, I'm not trying to impose on you, but what I want to do is come over and share some good information. I love to share with you what I'm doing to sell properties. I love to go through exactly what I think buyers love about your house, what they might not like, what might be holding it back from selling, and really take you through what I'm doing. If nothing else, maybe you get some tips on some things you want to try doing before you hire an agent. But I think when we, uh, when we meet together in person that you're really going to like what I'm saying, it sounds like we would work really well together. And, uh, and I think I can help you give, get, get you some good information so you can get down to Florida. Yeah. So, so there you got, you guys, I mean, that's perfect, Kevin. That's good. Yeah. And you'd set the appointment that the, the, the reality is we keep, I keep asking you to do the role plays because there is no magic words. Yeah. It's literally having a conversation. We're asking questions yep. about their motivation. And then when we hear an opportunity, it's as simple as saying, Kevin, let me ask you, I mean, at the end of the day, if I could help show you how to get the property sold and net you the money that you need in your pocket, would you consider looking at that? And it's real simple. You just got to ask. Yeah. No so, confrontation is a big no part. No confrontation. Never yeah. have any, if you're going to have some confrontation with this guy, if you were completely different and you were short and you have confrontation in person, don't ever have it on the phone. Let them win that battle because you're going to win the fucking war. You know, I always say that. You're, when you get there, you're going to win that war because they can't hang up on you. They have all the power when you're on the phone. But when you're in person, you can take control over that conversation. 
A face-to-face -face appointment changes everything. You guys ever heard of that before? All right, so two, last two questions for you, Kevin. One, what percentage of the time do you uh, go to a listing appointment, get the contract signed on the spot versus having to go back a second time? 100%. 100%. It's crazy. I either get the listing or I don't get the listing for me. Now, there are times, I guess, where I didn't get it signed. They wanted to think on it and they call me back and they're like, all right, just send it through eSign. Because that's how I leave it is saying, I'm not going back out there again. I don't give a shit what it is. So, I mean, yeah. I would say if I left there and they need to think about it, I would always go through, okay, well, what is there to think about? Because typically when you have something to think about, I didn't cover something fully. I make a lot of these presentations. Maybe I left something out. Let's talk about this. What is there to think on? And then I'll go through that objection and then try to give them a sign. If they end up not signing, I'll say, listen, here's what we can do. You can take your time and I think I'm not trying to pressure you at all, but when you are ready, I'm going to call you first thing tomorrow morning. Hopefully you might have some questions for me then. If you decide to move forward, my assistant's going to shoot you over the marketing docs. We just need e-sign. All you have to do is click to sign those and we're good to go. And usually they're fine with that. And it's just all confidence. And so uh, this is the, I have one other question besides this one because the, the myth, Kevin, is certainly for you to list as many homes as you're doing for sale by owners expired, you must be discounting your commission almost every single time. Yeah, I never discount my commission. Now <laughs> it happens if, let's just say that you never discount your commission from the start. So let's just say, go ahead, role play it. Tell me you want me to cut my commission. Yeah, Kevin, listen, I mean, we like you a lot, but at this point, you know, 6% is a lot. I mean, you know, can you, can you do anything better? Yeah, Brandon, and I can appreciate you asking that. Obviously, I know that, that it takes some guts asking me that on, on this side, and I think that, that again, we, we'd work really well together. Now, when you ask me that on this side, Brandon, I have to ask myself, which one of my services can I afford to cut out of the marketing of your property? Because if I'm cutting my commission, I have to cut some of my services. And I'm taking a look, I'm taking a look at professional photos and videos and, and what we're doing behind the marketing of the property and how we're pre-screening buyers and our courier is gonna do all the lot box and our closing coordinator who takes care of the closing side and how we're following up on home inspections and appraisals. I don't see anything here, Brandon, that we can cut out and still sell your property and get you the amount of money that you need. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so I mean, is there anything in there that you would want me to cut out? I would even take that approach. Is there anything in there that you would want me to cut out? Nope. Then great. Let's just move forward. And let's just say there's some more hesitate or there's some more, they're, they're angry. Well, well, Bob, Bob down the street at Remax, you know, he said he'd do it for, you know, I got agents in here doing it 4%, 4.5%. You're, you're, yeah. you're in six. Listen, that's an option. There, there's some agents out there that will do it for four and a half or, or 5%. But one thing I want to do, I don't want to cut any corners on you, Brandon. The price that we're trying to get isn't a giveaway price. We're trying to maximize your sales price here. You care about how much money you put in your pocket at the end of the day, right? You don't care about how much commission you put, you really pay out. It's about how much money you're putting in your pocket. So I'm confident my strategy is going to put that money in your pocket. So that's why I think that we move forward at the commission that I'm charging right now with you. And I'm confident that I can help you put that money in your pocket. It's just keeping on going back to that. You never make them wrong, but you right. make them have to think about, oh, he's right. Well, what is Bob? Do you think Bob's doing the same things I'm doing to market properties? Right. Or, I mean, you can just start turning this around. Again, you never want to make them wrong, but if it goes real far and they're not budging, they're saying, Kevin, listen, I appreciate everything you're saying, but I'm just going to be very transparent. I will not sign this listing commission for anything under five or anything over 5%. I say, Brandon, listen, I can appreciate that. Again, I think we'll work really well together. But, but one thing that I'm committed to is getting you the most amount of money. So me cutting my commission at the very start isn't going to get us any closer to that because I still don't have any buyers for the property. So let's do this. Let me go out there. Let me market it. Let me get buyers in the property. Let me get you some offers. And once we have those offers, if we're off by a thousand dollars or half a percent or one percent, let's reevaluate this conversation. And trust me, I will make the smart business move. But but from the start, don't make me scale back on what I offer before we even have a buyer on the table. It's phenomenal. What I keep hearing, Kevin, and the reason why you list 200, 300 houses a year, is simply my biggest takeaway so far is confidence. You're not backing down because you know you can get the job done where most agents are so timid. You know, will you cut your commission? Absolutely. How long, how low do I need to go? All right. You know, and, yeah. and that is not what we're talking about today. So let's leave on this note. You've got some young, young children as do I. Yep. If your kids got in the business and they hired dad, you to be their coach, what would be one, two, three things that you can leave this group with, that you would coach your kids that would get them the best chances to win as a listing agent in this business? 
I think the first thing is seeing what they're committed to. So what are you committed to doing, first off? Let, let's not play game. Don't fool yourself because you have to have integrity with yourself. Mm. If you don't have integrity with yourself, man, you're going to be very unhappy. If you're unhappy, you're never going to do anything the way you want to do it. So what are you committed to? Whether that's I'm committed to doing whatever it takes to do 40 deals this year. I'm committed to do whatever it takes to do 100,000 100, in GCI. Okay, so great. So what is 100,000 GCI? Do you want to work sellers, buyers? I want to work both. Okay, which one do you want to work more of? I think I'd rather work more sellers. So how many days a week are you committed to working the sellers versus buyers? You really got to dive into the math behind it. And at the end of it, you realize, okay, well, you're committed to making 30 phone calls a day, talking to this many people. You want to be in this price point. You only want to work with sellers. There was only this amount of seller transactions last year. So for you to do this, here's what you have to do. You have to make 100 contacts a day. You have to get 12 email addresses. You have to set four appointments a day. You have to go on two appointments and you have to do one price reduction every three days. And if you do that, you're going to be right on pace to hit your goal. Hmm. And then it's, okay, well, I don't want to do that because I don't want to make 100 contacts a day. Okay, well, let's go back to the start. Then you don't want to do 40 transactions. What about 35? What's the math on 35? And get yourself an integrity for yourself. Because, man, it starts feeling good when you do what you say you're going to do to yourself. Yeah. Well, and I think the challenge uh, for, for the work that I do at my company, I've got 200 agents on my team, and I'm, yeah. and I'm coaching almost 400 agents here. The pushback that I get is all the distractions and shiny objects like, Kevin, come on, man. Isn't there a better way? Like, do I have to make the calls? Can I do something different? Like, I see all these people on YouTube and the Tom Ferry guys and these sexy businesses. Are you telling me I just have to make phone calls? Dude, turn that shit off. That's what I tell them. I honestly wouldn't let my kids get on YouTube. There was a solid six months where I, I went no social media, no YouTube, no anything. There's just too much information, man. And one thing you do, again, once you get clear on what you want, one thing that you have to be very careful of is who you share it with. Because let's just say I share with you my goals and you tell me, like there was this guy that I met at the Century 21 conference. And I was like, yeah, here's what I'm doing this year and here's where I'm set to do and here's what I'm doing investing in property and this and that, this is what I'm doing. He's like, man, why don't you do this? It's like, whoa, like, dude, you can't tell me what, to, like, you, this is my, my strategy. This is what I want to do. Like yeah. You have to be very careful on who you tell what you want and what your strategy is because everybody's going to have an opinion. And then they could start making you doubt what you want and doubt your opinion. So I'm very clear when somebody's like, hey, man, what are you going to do this year? What are you up to? Or kind of what's your goals and strategies? I say, great, I'm going to tell you all of this. But to be transparent with you, I don't want your opinion. Like you're tell I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do and what I want to do and where my goals are. And I'm not trying to be rude. And I don't want to hear anything critiquing any part of it. Because this is what I've laid out and this is what I'm going to do. Because, dude, you tell Brandon, you're going to tell me to make more contacts. And Brandon's going to tell me to send more emails. He's going to tell me to do this. He's going to tell me to take off weekends. He's going to tell me the best time to work on weekends. He's going to tell me to go home and nap for two hours. He's going to tell me to play tennis. Everybody's going to have their different opinions. So you have to figure out what makes you happy, what you want, what your ideal life and what your ideal business looks like. And then write a game plan, a strategy back in the map and follow it and do it. Oh my gosh, Kevin, you just gave me freaking goosebumps. Be careful who you surround yourself with because I'm telling you the sheep in this world that can't do what you can do want to give you advice all day long. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I have people in my life that don't make half the money I make, not even a quarter. Yeah. They got all kinds of advice from me, you know? Well, Brandon, you should do this and your schedule's to this and you're to that and you're to, okay. Don't take advice from sheep. Yeah, yeah, lions don't, don't mess with sheep. Um, but, but I can tell you on this side, it, 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 it's so imperative to, to not even who you surround yourself with, just who you listen to, what chatter you hear. Like mm. don't put yourself in any situation to hear any chatter that you don't want to hear. And that's why, man, if any of you guys go on my Facebook or my Instagram, you don't see much and you don't see, and that needs to change. And I'm obviously losing business by not doing that. I'm not telling you guys not to do that. But it's just been purposeful as far as, yo, I'm staying in my lane and I'm going to hit it as hard as I can. If you go to a Mike Ferry event or a Tom Ferry event or whatever it is, and I might be there, I'll never be on stage. I'll never be part of that conversation. But you'll see, and I'm not trying to boast on myself, you'll see every single person who is on that stage come over and have a conversation with me and ask me some things. And it's because I'm very intentional with my time. I'm not trying to overinflate anything. Anything I'm telling you today, man, is what I'm doing. I'm not trying to tell you guys what to do. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. And you can choose to do it. Or you can choose not to do it. Does it work with your strategies? Does it work with your game plan? Does it work with your systems? And if so, man, you should implement it. Yeah, I, I will leave them with this, Kevin, is, is you 
are a man of integrity. Our friendship over the past four years has been from afar because you've told me no over and over and over. You're like my old girlfriend. I won't, I can't get on the phone again because so he's so diligent with his time. You guys, it's so real. He's not getting caught up in all the hype. He's actually doing everything he says he's doing. And the guy is 29 years old, going to make $1.4 million in 2020. It's a great life. Kevin Mills, thank you so much for the time, man. We're yeah, going to have a great idea. Wish you guys the best. Go out there and get it, guys. Go out there and get it. Appreciate it, Kevin.